It's time to take global stories that made headlines on national dailies this morning. And joining us to review the papers is <coughs> Professor Camilo Sani Fage. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, joining us from Kanu. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good morning, and thank you for having me. As always, good morning. All right, let's start with the business, NG. And this was one of our top trending stories this morning. Um, it says, OB's team rejects allegations of inciting protests. Now, the federal government has said or allegedly said that um, Peter OB from the Labour Party, um, they are inciting protests um, that is anti-government and saying that um, as long as the, the um, president has been elected, he needs to do his term and then finish and people can go to the polls in 2027 if they are dissatisfied with what the president has done. And so they are saying that Labour Party is the one inciting this protest. And I think the, the hashtag for this is Tinubu must go and I think Revolution 24 or something like that. What do you think about the fact that the government is always playing this blame game? It's either they're blaming the past administration or they're blaming other parties saying that they're inciting um, protests that would just lead to unrest in the country. What do you think about this? And do you think other parties are really just anti-government and maybe they're doing it because they're just not happy that they did not win? No, I, th I think uh, the blame game will take us nowhere. Uh, the reality on ground is that people are not happy. Uh, people are praised with uh, hunger, poverty, inflation, insecurity, and what have you. So the government ought to listen to this instead of passing the buck and saying uh, it is the opposition. Actually, um, I don't know whether the opposition has sent or whatever, but the reality is that these are things that are factual, which uh, the leaders, uh, like I say, should pays their attention and pays their own focus on these issues and instead of uh, blame here, blame there, because it is a dangerous thing to play with. And by the time the leadership keep on denying the existence of these uh, problems, I think by the time they realize that the, real, the problems are real, uh, it will be too late. So whether the opposition is uh, supporting it or not, that should be immaterial. Uh, what should be most important is for the government to look at uh, uh, the issues as they affect uh, Nigerians, okay? So I think blame game is, is a wrong tactics. And uh, like I said, it is a dangerous one. Uh, so the government has to look at uh, these issues understand that these issues are real do you think they don't know that these issues are real because it comes from it seems um they're being lackadaisical they know that these issues persist there's economic hardship there is no food there's food insecurity there are so many things that if we want to count we'll say these are the things that are happening in nigeria farmers cannot go to their farms because there's insecurity people are getting kidnapped on a daily basis now even school children are being kidnapped because of insecurity there is farmers cannot even farm because of course they don't have the right equipment they don't have seedlings our um, manufacturing companies are leaving even people who had come here to invest they're leaving because the economic uh, the economy is not sustainable it's not thriving enough for them to make their money back and then of course insecurity as well so when you talk about people having to have their salary, we just finally concluded on the minimum wage recently, which now stands at 70,000 naira. That is not even enough for families to feed. So knowing all of these things, do you think the government, they don't know what's going on? Or is it just coming from a place of, we really don't care? Yeah, I think the government is fully aware of all these problems. One, they have the security report, intelligence report that will tell them. Two, if you look at the various speeches by leaders uh, from the president downwards, they always say that uh, they know Nigerians are in problem, but they always call on the people to be patient and uh, that uh, there will be a light at the end of the tunnel. So by that, they are admitting that they know there is a problem. I think what happened is that the leaders take Nigerians for granted. They know 
and they believe that uh, whatever happens with Nigerians, Nigerians will just grant them and then lap it out and life will continue. So I think that is a risky gamble when you always think that uh, people will take whatever you dish to them and uh, nothing will happen. So it's a risky and costly gamble. Secondly, it is also risky and complex, um, uh, gamble that uh, costly gamble rather by trying to have a kind of blame game so that you now can divert the attention. The issue of um, uh, saying it is the opposition, it is this, all are attempt to uh, whittle down, to water down the process I and mean, the problem and divert people's attention. Now that uh, tactics will pay for a while, but uh, as things go on, I think that the tactics will backfire. So the sooner the better for the government to now not only call on people to make sacrifices, but the leaders should show that they are leading by example. They are the ones who will make sacrifices. And uh, they should also sympathize with Nigerians and take measures. But all what we are doing, I think it's a wrong uh, thing. And it is not only wrong, it is dangerous. Uh, because by the time you keep push, push on, pushing people and you back them to the world, you don't know what they are going to do. Because people are capable of even things that they never knew they could do when their backs are up against the wall. Because at the end of the day, we all as humans have our own survival skills and we always want to survive. So if you push us against the wall, we're always going to fight back. Now, I don't know if the protest is going to be the best way to fight back, but I think it is important for the government to listen to the people because that's what democracy is all about. You cannot say that you're being elected to a position where it was people who put you there and you're deciding to be tone deaf to their own plight. It is important that you listen to them. You put the necessary measures, policies, actions in place that would alleviate the sufferings of the people. All right, so another, um, another headline here still talks about our economy, sort of, and it says Naira set to stabilize. Analysts predict exchange rates balance by end by year end of 2024. Now, we know that earlier this year, the Naira plummeted really, really low when it comes to the dollar. It was super weak. And we're seeing um, figures like about 1,900 Naira to the dollar. The CBN did some magic, some abracadabra, and you, you, we started to see the Naira gain strength. And it came as low as um, 1,100 Naira to the dollar, which everybody was happy about. But all of a sudden, we started to see um, the Naira get weak again. And we were wondering, so what was all the magic that you did? But seeing it here, whereby they're saying, well, analysts now are saying narratives um, stabilized by the end of 2024. Do you think that's going to happen? Especially with this other headline here that says CBN sells $106.5 million to 29 authorized FX dealers in two days. So we need this, we need this inflow. We need this cash. We need this FX. Um, and of course, that has a, um, it has a bearing with whatever is happening with our own currency as well. So if we're seeing whereby so many people need, they need this cash and the, the rate is really high at the moment, but analysts are saying it will stabilize by the end of 2024. Do you think that's really going to happen or is just some magic they're about to perform again while we're looking? You see, by simple economic rule, uh, it is not going to happen because where you have your currency, uh, an exporting country is where you know, now the value can fluctuate up and down. But where we are importing country, heavily importing country, you know, these are just artificial things that we create. The government will now come and uh, pump in money, whether openly or underground, uh, so that they can now see the, the currency has stabilized. Unless you take a holistic approach and now look at uh, what is happening, and that is when you can hope the Naira to stabilize, not appreciate. But uh, like I said, if we as in Nigeria, we are just consumer country, we don't expect it to 
uh, to appreciate. All that we are seeing are just artificial measures taken by the uh, policy makers. And like, I, I don't want to be uh, repeating the same word. We are just deceiving ourselves and uh, saying that these are things out they are working. But in reality, we know, we know how dangerous it is for us to continue along this trend because uh, the direct implication and all other measures that we are seeing is uh, generally and primarily dependent on the fact that we are a consuming nation. So uh, whatever we do, we can be saying that, yeah, there is that one. And look at what they say, our foreign reserve has appreciated, this thing has done that, but we keep on uh, borrowing. So a country that borrows, a country that imports, a country that embezzles, a country that has a kind of uh, high expensive uh, recent tests, and a country that runs a, a very expensive government, will all these are all recipes that our currency will not um, be strong as we are being told. Well, if we look at the guard, um, the Guardian, it says. MPC, that's a Monetary Policy Committee, costly policy trade-off as FX crisis, minimum wage, stir fresh challenge. So, of course, they're saying they're doing this work, but sometimes you, you wonder, how does that even affect me? How does that affect me as a common man? What are the changes I'm even seeing in this economy as a person? So do you think they're doing enough for the common man? Or this is just something that is on paper? whereby they say, oh, we're working, oh, we're doing this. But it's not really, there's no effect when it comes to the masses. Do you think they're doing enough? Or, is, or there's something more that they could do? And if you were just to chip in a few words, what do you think the government can do better to ensure that our economy is thriving? Yeah, you see, uh, they are, one, they are not doing enough for, uh, to better the condition of uh, the ordinary person. Uh, secondly, the policies that the government uh, is taking is a, a compounding issues. I see in one of the papers they say the government is targeting about two something trillion from banks on FX, uh, you know, uh, for windfall. Now you see there is no country that uh, tax its way out of our uh, inflation, out of economic crisis. We know that it is basic economic rule. And uh, here we are, the government uh, keeps on uh, trying what, uh, after all, is the source and the cause of the problem. Taxation here, devaluation here, no subsidy there, and, and so on. So unless the government look at these uh, issues, which are the source of the problem, I uh, will end up just treating the symptom. And uh, it's like somebody who is sick, uh, instead of you to address the illness, you are just treating the symptom. So no matter uh, the amount of palliatives and other measures that you are taking, you know, they cannot even solve the symptom, let alone talk to, I mean, addressing the real disease. So what the government should do is that they are aware and they are fully aware, they are only denying the fact that uh, these are the source of the problem. So unless the government address the source of the problem, uh, actually all the measures that we are desperately doing, catch this one, try this one, it fails, we go to another one, uh, we'll keep on uh, trial and error, but uh, I'm sorry to say the trial and error will take us nowhere. All right, still on The Guardian, it says Dangote rejects monopoly claims, halts investment in steel industry. And if you just look at that with um, what's on the Vanguard, it says here that our refinery having repeated orders from abroad. So Dangote has been accused of trying to have a monopoly, especially when it comes to um, the local refinery here in Nigeria. And then uh, the operators have said that the federal government is not really working with them. Instead, the federal government has been against them. 
and with the Dangote refinery, they're just saying it's they want to have like the monopoly. But Dangote here is even saying um, our refinery having repeated orders from abroad. Do you think that the federal government is supposed to be working with the local refineries to ensure that um, you know we're refining our own crude, and then of course the cost implication to that is going to be removed. And if we do not start somewhere, how do we get to develop our own um, our own economy or our own um, infrastructure here in Nigeria, especially? when it comes to things like this, like refineries, do you think that it is important for the government to understand um, having to work with these local refineries and, you know, the opportunities that it could even bring um, along the way? You see, it's, it's not a question of thinking. It is a must for the government to uh, encourage uh, local refineries. Uh, but unfortunately for us, uh, uh, some people, as Dangote said, they are internal and external cabals trying to sabotage the the whole process. One, uh, I think in this, about two, three papers today, they say that uh, the uh, regulatory agency uh, have not yet issued lessons for uh, to Dangote refinery to take up. Secondly, they have been criticizing the industry that uh, their own product is substandard, it is high in sulfur. And there are so many things which, if you now go back to history, you see that whenever any indigenous person invents, invents something, some people will find a way to kill it. Already money has been sunk in uh, in this industry, but it is being sabotaged here and there. I think about two weeks or three weeks, I'm going to uh, complain about um, non-availability of uh, raw materials, that it is either not available or that it is being sold at a high rate. Uh, I remember he said he had to pay about $6 more uh, on that, and he has to import it from way above I mean, America to, for his needs. And now there are issues about licensing, about standards, about this. So, and now they are also talking about monopoly. You see, all over the world, the countries, even America, China, and, uh, and European countries, all try to encourage their own internal or domestic industries to make sure they work and survive in a hostile competitive uh, uh, environment but here we are some people because of what they will get uh, and the, the corrupt nature of the, the whole exercise they will continue to sabotage this as far as i'm concerned uh, what, what the government should do is to look at uh, what are the challenges of Dangote. Is it going to be a monopoly? They create others so that uh, they can compete. Is it uh, substandard? Then give give them um, regulations as to how they should standardize. So whatever it is, they try to take measures that will make it uh, you know work and uh, make it uh, so that the product will be affordable. You see, beside affordability. It has uh, the issue of uh, national image. Here we are, we have an indigenous uh, industry that will compete with anyone. So it's a national pride. And then there is also the possibility of, you know, uh, solving our own problems in, in, in terms of our needs. All these are the things that our policies may, policy makers should take into consideration instead of uh, trying tooth and nail to sabotage the, the whole project, they should now see how do we make it standard and affordable and workable in Nigeria. It's having to work for our nation and understanding that, you know, just encouraging our local manufacturers, our local refineries, anything that is indigenous to Nigeria, because other countries started from somewhere. These countries that you're saying their products are better, they started from somewhere. So like you have rightly pointed out, if you need um, the, the product to have a better quality, it's as simple as putting regulations in place and saying this is how we want you to standardize this product and that's what we want. If you put that in place and implement it, then 
you might just get something better. And Dangote is also saying that they have orders from abroad. So that means there are people who are searching for these products. But here in Nigeria, there's a cabal that might just be trying to sabotage what we have. And I hope that the federal government looks into this and encourage local refinery, not just local refinery, local manufacturers, anything that is, um, you know, by Ninja to grow the Naira. I think that is what we should be looking at. Anything that would strengthen our own, um, our own currency, our own economy, that would ensure that it's more sustainable and is thriving, then that's what we should be looking at. Instead of thinking of how to import stuff whereby there is a cost implication to that and we're obviously going to be losing more money okay so let's just still talk about crude on the vanguard it says economy faces threats with 1.4 million barrels per day crude output the riders here says industry experts point to dark spots make recommendations we can produce um, 2 million barrels per day that is being said by the nnpc Nigeria needs energy minister, not president, to drive industry. That is being said by Agbakoba. And um, NUPRC concluding div divestment to boost output. That is being said by Komolafe. Um, so we're looking at our own crude output right now, which is at 1.4. We have the capacity of 2 million. And I think we used to do about 2 million in the past, but we've seen it um, plummet down to about 1.4 and this is something that is supposed to be our major source of revenue because we're not really looking into agriculture we're not really looking into manufacturing we're not really looking into other sector the moment crude came that's where all the focus went to which is not even the best by the way but these same products that we've put all our eggs into this one basket we're not even um, utilizing the resources as much as we should what do you think about the story? The fact that the economy faces threats with 1.4 million barrel per day crude output. Yeah, you see, it is, it is a serious economic challenge that uh, we are not able to produce um, what uh, the quota that we should be producing, which is about 2 million barrel, which shows that uh, we are losing about uh, 600 million barrels per day. But I think it, uh, there are so many factors. One uh, is the fact that you see we are still relying on foreign companies to extract uh, the oil for us. And uh, we rely on what they tell us. Okay, now, there are no Nigerians, if you go to the uh, oil rigs, there are no Nigerians, there is this, uh, this multinational who will do it, and now they will report we have ex uh, uh, we are exporting social amount. That is one thing. So there will be a high rate of, uh, you know, under reported of the case. Secondly, there is also issue of oil set. And so even if we produce more, some people are there and they are stealing it. And so these are some of the reasons why uh, we are uh, producing below uh, the, 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 the capacity. Otherwise, all this issue of government desperately looking for taxation, doing this, doing that, they, they could have addressed the reasons why we are under producing and try to plug the holes here and there. But uh, that is easier said than done because of the high level of corruption in the place. So that is why we are not able to produce. But look at other countries that uh, are producing oil and see how they take measures. They now make sure that uh, oil is a national uh, resource. Oil is... Uh, so much so that uh, it is uh, the life source of their own countries and they have taken measures uh, ranging from uh, you know uh, ways to uh, manage it making sure that uh, they produce it and uh, making sure that the companies that are producing it they are producing it at a, a cheaper rate but here in nigeria i think we have the highest the cost of production if you take uh, per capita how much they charge and more seriously is the fact that they we, they just do whatever they want to do and tell us that is what they produce there are no nigerians in the place to check 
and there are also problem of uh, SEP. So that is part of the reason. Uh, literally, the government is uh, incapable of monitoring the, uh, the the real production. So that is why we are hearing is only one point four that is being produced. But at it being there is proper monitoring. I'm telling you. We'll find out that what they are extracting in Edi will be far more than two point something billion barrels per day. Look at these challenges and try as much as possible to um, address them, especially with the oil theft that you just um, spoke about as well. We need to just address these challenges and be able to have our own quota, like um, you know, just perform right do whatever is right to ensure that we meet our quota um, of about 2 million barrels per day. Let's move over to Nature News, which is the final paper this morning. And Nature News leads with IITA partner donate improved um, grain seeds to Yobe farmers. So they've um, partnered and donated some seedlings to Yobe farmers. Now, IITA, it's, 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 it's amazing, right? But don't you think the federal government should even be the ones trying to do this? Looking at farmers, finding ways to um, help them if they need to donate seedlings, if they need to um, donate fertilizers, if they need to gift them, um, you know, machinery. Why is, I know IITA is doing their own bit, which is amazing, um, but is the federal government not supposed to be having initiatives like this and ensuring that um, this can help with our own food security in Nigeria? What do you think about this? Yeah, I think it is the responsibility of the government. And that is where if you want to improve uh, agriculture, uh, where people will have confidence. Already now the talk of the town is the GMO grains, and uh, people are very skeptical that it is uh, uh, GMO modified uh, grain. So I doubt it very much if people will accept, and even if they are given uh, this uh, improved uh, variety, I doubt it very much if people will plant it because already people are scared about uh, yeah, this issue of uh, GMO uh, grains. So I think the government should have been the one that to lead because people have trust, they have confidence in their leaders in the government. So it, even if it is IIT, IIT, IIT uh, that is producing, it, it should have been through the government. But otherwise, given this tense situation, I doubt it very much if we are going to see the result. Many, many farmers will not ag uh, agree to uh, use uh, these uh, grants that are given by ITA. An Institute of Tropical Agriculture, which is fantastic that you're doing this, by the way. And I know that having to give these grains, these seedlings to farmers is one thing, but even planting it is another, like you've said. And when we even think about insecurity as well, most of these farmers cannot go to the farms. So it's important that the government, imperative in fact, that the government, you know, look at security measures for these farmers and give them what they need for their planting season. Anyways, Professor, I want to say thank you for coming. It's always a pleasure reviewing the papers with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Okay, we're speaking with Professor Camilo Sani Fage. He's from the Department of Political Science by Yero University, joining us from Kanu. And we've just been taking global stories, making headlines in our national dailies. We'll